Good evening, everyone, uh, and thanks for coming along tonight and for, for your continued interest in D House and, uh, and the amphitheatre. Uh, my name's Andy Foster, and I'm chair of the D House and Amphitheatre Working Group. On behalf of the Working Group, I'd like to set out our draft findings and recommendations tonight, which will be submitted to the Council, subject to your feedback. After I've done this, there'll be an opportunity for discussion with members of the Working Group and others who I'll point out later. There'll also be an opportunity, uh, as you've probably seen already, to record your comments and feedback on the recommendations. This is an important part of the process that we're going through and will be included in the final version of the, of the report that we submit. Anyone that knows anything about D House knows that it's a complex issue. It's been the subject of an ongoing and somewhat polarised debate and that so far nothing has happened. In attempting to summarise the findings of the working group, I must therefore take care. On the one hand, I don't want to present things in such a brief way that you think I've skimmed over important matters, but equally we could be here for a very long time if I was to describe everything that the working group uh, has learnt and considered over the past 12 months. Hence, my explanation this evening will be necessarily limited to headlines and key issues. Also, because the issue is important, uh, I don't want to get things wrong or mess anything up, uh, which is why I've elected to read this uh, summary of our findings, and I hope that's not going to make things too, too tedious for you. I should also point out I'm suffering a little bit and I might be coughing and spluttering a bit. Um, so, um, my plan this evening is to um, outline uh, some of the background context to D House briefly deal with the issues of demolishing D House uh, and excavating the remainder of the uh, amphitheatre, deal with the issues of the possibility of saving D House and finally outline our conclusions and recommendations. I'll then take some questions of clarification uh, before we adjourn next door to discuss the recommendations in more detail. But I thought I'd b bite the bullet uh, and um, rather than leave some of the big conclusions to the end, to put those up, up front so you can see where we're headed. Um, so we've concluded as a group that demolition uh, of D House is not possible. We've also concluded that even if demolition was possible, excavation of the remainder of the amphitheatre is also not possible. We've concluded that saving D House is possible, although given its condition, it's not straightforward and a pragmatic approach to its restoration and reuse is required in order to secure its future. These conclusions inevitably mean that we must leave some aspirations behind and con concentrate on what is realistic. And I know that some people will be disappointed by this, but please bear with me as I'll get to the reasons behind these conclusions uh, in due course. So, some context first. I'm not going to trawl through the entire recent history of D House, but just to remind everyone that the building came into council ownership 28 years ago. During the time since, the debate has rumbled on between whether to save the building or demolish them, and whether to excavate the remainder of the amphitheatre and create something world-class from the important Roman origins. As we know, this debate has never reached a satisfactory conclusion. Nothing has happened and the condition of the buildings has deteriorated substantially over the years. The most recent attempt to do something was in 2017 when Daniel Thwaites PLC began a serious attempt to refurbish the buildings and convert them into a boutique hotel. This proposal was abandoned a year later when the high costs of safe access to the buildings became known. Following the demise of the Thwaites scheme, various discussions took place between the Council and Chester Growth Partnership, which resulted in the formation of the current working group. The idea of the group was to gather, people, to gather together people who represented the diversity of local opinion to see if a way forward could be found. Essentially, we were asked to find a solution after 28 years of inaction. In the event, we've acted a bit like a common select committee, calling in experts covering a wide range of subjects to inform and enlighten us. We were meant to be together 
for about six months, uh, but ended up being slowed down by a total of three uh, elections last year and the PERDA requirements that come with them. However, it's worth noting that of the 12 months that we have been together, 11 months were spent gathering facts and only one month debating the conclusions. I'd just like to thank all members of the working group for their enthusiasm and commitment over that time and for respecting the process that we've been through. I'd also like to thank Caroline Thomas and Bethany Skinner from the Council for all their hard work in managing and supporting the group. And particular thanks are all, uh, also due to the many people uh, who gave up their time uh, to speak to us and share their knowledge. So, moving on. The components of the house. Um, here uh, on this uh, plan that's coming up um, are those components. The original townhouse uh, in blue, uh, built for the Cumberbatch family, dates from approximately 1730 and is therefore Georgian. Chapel wing to the east is by the architect Edmund Kirby and dates from 1867. The west wing was added in various stages from 1870 onwards. And the further extension of the original house in Georgian style, perhaps surprisingly, dates from only 1900. The next slide shows the front ele elevation with those uh, respective dates. Next point, ownership. Um, this following slide uh, illustrates the ownership of the site, or the primary ownership. Um, area A uh, is the uh, area in council ownership, which in incorporates uh, D House. Area B uh, is in government ownership, that's the excavated part of the um, uh, uh, amphitheatre. But on behalf of the government, it's in the guardianship of English heritage. And then Area C uh, is the ownership uh, associated with the court building, uh, and that is a private separate ownership. Also superimposed uh, on this diagram is the footprint of the amphitheatre and there are a couple of important things to recognise about this plan. Firstly, the amphitheatre is a, a scheduled ancient monument uh, and this means that the archaeology beneath the house is in the control of the Secretary of State who is advised by Historic England. Secondly, although the court building itself only straddles a small section of the amphitheatre, uh, the amphitheatre footprint, uh, the associated ownership covers uh, a much bigger area. Uh, and this area is effectively out of bounds to our considerations. Next point to do with the archaeology of the amphitheatre. Um, we were very grateful to uh, Tony Wilmot of uh, Historic England for the presentation that he gave to the group and subsequently to the public meeting in June on the archaeology of the uh, excavated area of the amphitheatre. I can't possibly do his contribution justice in, in a few words, um, but the important things that we learnt were as follows. There is evidence of occupation of the site going back 8,000 years, uh, not just the 2,000 years since the Roman period. That a great deal is known about the construction of the amphitheatre in its various forms. But most of what is known is derived from the imprint uh, that the amphitheatre left in the ground, rather than from actual physical remains, of which there is some, but not a great deal, as most of it was robbed out to build other buildings, uh, most notably St John's Church. Much medieval and later archaeology was discovered in the layers above the amphitheatre. St John's Precinct uh, was the subject uh, of a talk from Professor uh, Stuart Ainsworth, uh, who uh, we were also grateful to uh, have along to a meeting. And again, I can't do his presentation justice either, um, uh, but amongst other things, we learnt the following. How it's commonplace uh, for places of worship to develop uh, alongside Roman amphitheatres. Hence, the presence of St John's Church follows a more general pattern. How Chester is once again unique, being the only city in the country to have two cathedral precincts. How the area between St John's and the Walls became the location for several Georgian townhouses, including Dee House, each with their own landscape grounds. How these were effectively small country houses in the city. How Catholicism was reintroduced to the city and how the convent was established uh, within Dee House in later years 
And Stuart emphasised how the uses in the vicinity of Dee House during and since the Roman period can be characterised as ones of recreation, congregation and education. Dee House significance. So uh, Dee House, as you know, is a Grade Two listed building and its history and significance is described in a report uh, prepared by Historic England uh, dating from 2016. They concluded that the original 1730s townhouse remains largely intact, though obviously altered and deteriorating. That it's one of two remaining Georgian townhouses of several that were built in the vicinity of St. John's and that took advantage of the setting being just outside the city walls and close to the groves which were developed uh, as a promenade. Uh, the chapel wing is by the important Liverpool architect Edmund Kirby, who was a pupil of E.W. Pugin and who worked for the well-known Chester architect John Douglas. The later additions, including the range along Souter's Lane, uh, while being part of the building's development and included in the listing, are of lesser significance. So that's a bit of context and I, I'd now like to uh, address some of the key issues that we've considered relating to the possibility of demolishing D House and excavating the remainder of the uh, amphitheatre. Um, first of all, delisting. The idea of delisting D House has inevitably come up many times, uh, it being much easier to obtain consent to demolish an unlisted building than a listed one. We learned that it is possible to have a building delisted, but this can only happen in circumstances where the original reason for the listing uh, is no longer extant. This might be the case, for example, if a building had been listed for a particular interior feature and that feature had subsequently been lost in, in a fire. In the case of D House, although its condition has deteriorated, the building is still largely intact and although its setting has changed over the years, its original context is still evident. Hence the reasons for its listing have not gone away. Therefore we have to conclude that delisting is not an option that's open to us. But do you need to uh, delist a listed building in order to demolish it? Well the answer to that turns out to be no, you don't. Um, although given that the listing process is intended to protect buildings of historic significance, you can probably guess that the demolition of a listed building will only be permitted in the most exceptional of circumstances. It turns out, in fact, that the hurdles to demolish a listed building are so high as to be almost impossible. The requirements to be achieved are set out in the National Planning Policy mm -hmm. Framework and are outlined uh, on this slide here. In the case of D House, None of the points are readily achievable, but even if they were, there is also a requirement that there must also be a fully worked up and realistic scheme for the future of the site following dem demolition, and that the benefit of that future proposal must outweigh the disbenefit of demolishing the listed building. In reality, the situation of these house doesn't come in anywhere near to satisfying the high level of uh, conditions for demolition consent, and we therefore have had to conclude that demolition is not a realistic option. And I'm going to consider, despite that, I'm still going to consider excavating the rest of the amphitheatre. Um, there are two aspects involve, involved in excavating the uh, rest of the amphitheatre that are significant. That is, aside from the fact that, of course, you must have already demolished the house in order to do it. Firstly, there is the issue of the excavation of the substantial ar archaeology that still remains between the ground floor level of the house and the level of the amphitheatre. As I mentioned earlier, the amphitheatre is a scheduled ancient monument, and this means that permission for excavation of this archaeology requires consent from the Secretary of State, who is advised by Historic England. Current archaeological philosophy is that Archaeology that is undisturbed and is safeguarded from future development should remain undisturbed and Historic England have reaffirmed that they would not support a proposal for its excavation. Secondly, there's the question of whether it's worth it or not. Here we have to recognise that it's not possible to ex excavate the full extent of the amphitheatre 
because primarily of the presence of the court building, which is under separate ownership. We also have to recognize that it, as an, it is anticipated that remains of the amphitheater to this southern half uh, section will be in a similar condition to what was found in the northern half. That is very little remaining of the amphitheater structure itself because it was robbed out for building materials. We have therefore concluded that excavation of the remainder of the amphitheater is both not possible or worth it. Now, we do, of course, recognize that those who have argued for the demolition of D House and excavation of the rest of the amphitheater have done so for good reason, namely to create an attraction that might be worthy of Chester, is world class and reflects the importance of what is thought to be or thought to have been the largest Roman amphitheatre in the UK. The working group has not dismissed the idea of a Roman attraction, nor for that matter an attraction that focuses on any other relevant historic period, either separately or in ways which emphasise the layered history of the site over 8,000 years. However, we have come to the realisation, for the reasons that I've given, that both the wholesale demolition of D House and the excavation of the rest of the amphitheatre are just not possible. And that any historic attraction or exhibition or interpretation of, of whatever kind will need to be developed within the context of D House remaining and that only the northern half of the amphitheatre will remain excavated. So to the issue of saving D House, um, I'm going to start with um, condition uh, first. As I said earlier, the building came into council ownership in uh, 28 years ago in 1993. Since then, the building has been the subject of arson, uh, vandalism, rot and decay. The central portion uh, of the, the building, the, the, uh, the pink bit, uh, um, is the original townhouse and the 1900 extension is now in a very poor state of repair. This area relies on, uh, upon temporary scaffolding to support it, and since installation, the decay has continued to destroy much of the internal timber joinery, increasing the extent of structural damage to the timbers, to the floor timbers and the roof. Some of the internal load-bearing walls have collapsed or have partially collapsed. The external walls are generally in reasonable condition, although there are there are areas that are bulging and may need strengthening. Sections of the roof are propped by scaffolding, particularly where original load-bearing elements have been destroyed. However, relatively speaking, the range along Suter's Lane uh, is in good condition and the Kirby Chapel is in better condition than the central parts. Again, as I said earlier, the last serious attempt to do anything with the building was by Daniel Thwaites, PLC, and their involvement was the result of a council-led procurement exercise, and their proposal was for a relatively straightforward refurbishment and conversion to a boutique hotel, combined with a small historic interpretation element. Thwaites pulled out when they established that the cost of gaining sa safe access to the building was prohibitively high. Now, having listened to a large range of people on the subject of the Thwaites proposals, it appears to us that their scheme was generally unloved by the local community. And there are some anecdot uh, anecdotal reasons why this might have been so, um, as follows. The decision to hand over to uh, the site to Thwaites was made before the public debate about D House had reached a satisfactory conclusion. It would result in the perceived loss of a community asset for 125 years to a wholly commercial operation. There was no community use, uh, the heritage interpretation was small, and the decision making was not collaborative with the local community. Now, moving on, um, before I can get to my next points, I've, I really have to introduce the concept of conservation deficit. Uh, which is a term that might not be uh, familiar to everyone, so uh, bear with me while I do a bit of uh, explaining. Clearly, in uh, normal circumstances, when a developer or investor refurbishes a building, they do so to derive a profit. 
This means that the cost of acquiring the building plus the cost of doing the work should be less than the eventual financial return. Otherwise, it's just not worth doing. This is patently obvious. In the case of heritage buildings that are in a poor state of repair, uh, the reinstatement cost can, of course, be considerably higher. Now, one way of thinking about things is that if the value of a normal building before any investment is zero, the value of a heritage building in disrepair is actually negative. And the conservation deficit simply represents the amount of this negative value. In the case of the Thwaite scheme, the figure of 350 to 500,000 pounds has been in circulation. But this represented the cost of only making the building safe as opposed to doing the work to put it right. So for the Thwaite scheme, that figure or range of figures was therefore only a portion of the conservation deficit. Knowing the full extent of the conservation deficit, as well as having a strategy for overcoming it, is an important consideration in any project, uh, and, and specifically one like D House, as it represents a significant component of any risk associated. Now I have to introduce uh, the Building Preserva Preservation Trust and the work that they've been doing uh, alongside uh, the working group. Um, so Cheshire Historic Building Preservation Trust has, amongst other things, uh, developed a strategy for dealing with the conservation deficit of D House, as well as for quantifying it. Building Preservation Trust is a not-for-profit not organisation whose main aims, not surprisingly, include the preservation and regeneration of historic buildings. They are often community-based and have the advantage of being able to access grants and low-interest loans that are not open to other people or organisations. The Cheshire Historic Building Preservation Trust is an adaptation of the long-established Chester Historic Building Preservation Trust. And as you can tell, their name is quite a mouthful, so in future I'll re just refer to them as the Preservation Trust. Now, under their chair, Tony Barton, the Preservation Trust obtained a small amount of funding from the Architectural Heritage Fund, which was topped up by the Council, Chester Civic Trust and Chester Archaeological Society to carry out a project viability appraisal for D House. This appraisal has looked at the conservation deficit and possible routes to how the building could be saved. And we are obviously grateful to Tony and the members of the Trust and other consultants working uh, on the scheme uh, as their work was carried out in parallel with that of the working group. So what were their conclusions? Um, firstly, how they plan to deal with the conservation deficit. So, Given the poor condition and unsafe nature of the central portion of D House, the Preservation Trust have concluded that a pragmatic approach uh, is required. Their strategy is to go in through the roof and to remove the internal features of this central part of the building via crane access. In this way, the work can proceed safely while any elements that are in a condition to be saved can be taken out and stored for reuse. Essentially, this means stripping out the interior of the central part of the building from the top down and providing temporary shoring to st stabilise the external walls whilst, whilst it's being done. Structural engineers have developed a scheme for doing this, which has been costed at approximately half a million pounds. This sounds like the same amount of money as for the Thwaite scheme, but it needs to be noted that, this is, that, with, that with this strategy, it's a figure that represents the whole conservation deficit and not just a part of it. The other feature of their scheme is that any rescued elements from this part of the building can be reused, though not necessarily in their original locations. And there is some significant advantage in altering the internal layout of the central area of the building, given that the south elevation has been blighted by the presence of the court building. The windows on this south elevation would have originally looked out onto a terrace garden, but instead have the blank wall of the court building a mere three to four metres away. So this is not a typical heritage conservation approach. A preservation trust would not normally be recommending such things as removal of heritage features and adopt, adoption of temporary retained facades. But as I said earlier, it's a pragmatic, a, a pragmatic one. It recognises the building's condition, 
reduces cost and reflects the situation that the building is now in. Of course, given the unusual nature of the strategy, it won't be without some difficulty in obtaining conservation consent. But it is one which we believe is realistic and we support the strategy developed by the Trust. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uses and routes to securing the building, uh, building's future. Both the Working Group and the Preservation Trust have considered future uses for the building, how the works might be funded and who or which organisation might take the lead. These things are all interrelated and I'll start by briefly considering who might lead. Just going back to the Thwaite scheme, that was an example of a commercial lead with a commercial use plus a small heritage component. To be viable, a commercial approach is going to need the conservation deficit to be eliminated in advance as they will want to maximise uh, their financial returns. A commercial developer may want to further modify the buildings and there are potential opportunities to do this, A, in the central area because of the uh, conditions and things that I've already uh, discussed, B, by modifying or even replacing the suitor's lane wing uh, because it is less significant, or C, by adding a further extension of some kind. But obviously, any of those suggestions would need consents uh, and these would be based on the merits of the proposals and subject to normal planning processes. The local authority is obviously going to be involved uh, in the future, but given the current financial climate, their ability to fund anything uh, is severely limited. It may be possible, though, for the council to fund the works associated with the conservation deficit, given that this is a limited and now quantified commitment. The Preservation Trust, though, provide another route, uh, either to obtain funding themselves to eliminate the conservation deficit and then seek a commercial development partner, or to obtain more significant funding and or loans to enable them to develop the buildings themselves. The Preservation Trust have the advantage of being able to tip the financial equation so that more of the building could be developed for heritage or community uses. In terms of the uses that the building could be put to, if a commercial developer were involved, then clearly the, use, the uses to them would be one of a number that generates a financial return in a city like Chester. And you only need to look around town to see what those uses might be. Um, and I won't uh, elaborate on them here. We have also considered the idea of a significant heritage attraction and have been advised that this option, although we might think is desirable, is unlikely to be viable because most organisations in this sector are operators rather than developers. Because the competition in this area is intense and because the D-House and amphitheatre site, in terms of scale and pulling power, is unlikely to draw sufficient footfall to be commercially viable on its own. The group has not ruled out the idea of a heritage attraction, but it requires someone or some organisation to emerge that so far hasn't emerged. The working group has also considered other potential heritage uses, distinct from attraction. We, we believe it to be obvious that a high quality heritage interpretation element should be incorporated in any scheme and that the potential for this should be maximised as far as possible. Whether that is something that focuses on the amphitheatre and the Roman period or is a broader reflection of the entire history of the site is probably, probably a decision for a later date. Although, as the full history of the site has become known, there seems to have been increasing enthusiasm for the latter. Heritage use might also mean consideration of the possibility of creating some form of museum whose subject area might be broader than that just associated with the immediate site. But here we bump into a whole host of other issues, notably the future of uh, the Grosvenor Museum uh, and the wider vision for Chester regarding the interpretation of its wider history. For there to be any progress in this area, the Council really needs to make some strategic decisions and this aspect is effectively beyond the remit of the working group. 
So finally, to conclusions and recommendations. Um, before I get to summarize them in a little bit of detail, I just wanted to remind everyone that our key objective was to find a way forward after 28 years of inaction. And we've taken that to mean to find a direction that is realistic, that is achievable, and stands a good chance of leading to action in the near future, not the medium or far future. So for the reasons that I set out earlier, we've established that it's not possible to pursue a route that would lead to the demolition of D House. We've also concluded that even if it were possible to demolish D House, it is neither possible to excavate the remainder of the amphitheatre, nor worth it. Through the work of the Preservation Trust, it's been possible to develop an approach for safeguarding D House. They have established the likely value of the conservation deficit, and this is linked to a particular strategy which recognises the perilous condition of the central parts of the building and takes a pragmatic approach towards its reinstatement. We support this approach. How the work is taken forward, with whom, and with what mix of final uses is not decided. Indeed, it cannot be decided without further work and discussions between the Council the Preservation Trust and potential external partners of whatever kind. We think that any solution needs to be imag imaginative and done with community involvement. The heritage component needs to be maximised, as do any public uses, but we have to recognise that there will need to be some form of commercial component sufficient to make the project viable. The routes to funding sources are limited, and we believe that the Preservation Trust offers advantages that should be considered and we think that should be explored. Like you, we only want the best outcome for Chester and for, for the future of this important site. There will be those that are critical because they favour demolition and excavation of the remainder of the amphitheatre, but we have come to the point, we think, where we need to make decisions based on what is possible given the constraints that currently exist. There may also be those that are critical because we haven't yet got to the point of advising exactly what should be done, by whom and with what funding source. I would, however, point out that the working group is, a, is an advisory body and we're not the executive. Given that we were constitute, uh, constituted to represent the diversity of opinion around the D House and Amphitheatre issue, we feel we've come a long way listening to the facts and issues that have been presented to us. It would have been a luxury to have made our recommendations having chosen from a, a range of viable alternatives. However, this has not been the case because the facts have led us to conclude that what is realistically possible is, as I have said, very limited. If our recommendations are to be taken forward, the next tranche of work is down to the Council and needs to comprise several components. To seek consent to stabilise D House by adopting the Preservation Trust strategy. To further explore and evaluate the potential, the potential of using the Pre Preservation Trust to pursue the scheme themselves. To further explore and evaluate approaches from developers and other external organisations who may now emerge in this new context. A context, um, all in the context of a further public, uh, of further public dialogue and utilising the, uh, uh, the good offices of the, this working group uh, who are keen to continue to help. That's it. Thank you.